Everyone knows that Mario is gaming's Mickey Mouse, being more recognizable these days than even the good lord himself. With him being in the spotlight now for decades upon decades, it's easy to overlook the fact that his gallant steed, Yoshi, was not only given games of his own, but an entire side-scrolling platforming series with unique mechanics that set it apart from the core Mario series. Yoshi games, and more specifically the Yoshi's Island series, not only gave us a new spin on the tried and true Mario formula, but kicked off an entirely separate spin-off series that, while not quite as successful as the core Mario series, still has stood the test of time. Over the years, I've played a bunch of the Yoshi games, but there's a lot of them I missed, and so I decided now is the time to change that. So today, join me as I take a look at every single game in the Yoshi series. But first, let's take a minute to talk about this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. I'm willing to bet that if you're watching this, you probably own a phone. If my brilliant assumption is correct, you should be playing Raid Shadow Legends, and if you aren't, you're totally missing out. Let me tell you about the coolest new faction in Raid, the Sylvan Watchers. Rather than building a sprawling city on the ground or in a cave, the Sylvan Watchers made their home in the Mistwood, a huge jungle in the east of Teleria. It's a dangerous trek, though, if you try to visit the Sylvan Watchers. If the beasts don't kill you, the Sylvan probably will for trespassing. Personally, my favorite new champion from the faction is Pathfinder Kate. Her design is really cool, and I love a good bow. To all new players, Raid's prepared something special. It's time to vote on your favorite favorite starter champion. Download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your in-game player ID, then go to championselect.playerium.com. Simply enter your player ID and vote. This vote runs from January 16th to February 10th for all new players in the US, with all eligible entrants having the opportunity to win awesome in-game and real-life prizes, including epic and legendary champions, in-game items, and even Amazon gift cards worth up to $1,000. Once the vote ends on February 10th, one champion will be crowned the winner, and the prize winners will be selected via a draw. Don't worry if you're an existing raid player, though, you can still get involved. Just head to championselect.playerium.com where you can find a special promo code that everyone can use for a small in-game gift. So what are you waiting for? Start playing raid today. Today. And if you're a brand new player and haven't started playing yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code on the screen to get a bunch of free bonuses worth $30. A free epic champion, Shinoru, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 epic skill tome. All these free treasures await you when you click my link, available for 30 days for new players only. So if you haven't started playing Raid yet, there's never been a better time, and thanks again to Raid for sponsoring the video. Alright, so... Normally, when I do these kinds of videos, I lay out a list of criteria for what games I'll be covering in the video, and originally, I was gonna specifically cover the Yoshi's Island games, but since both the Yoshi's Island games and Yoshi's spin-offs and such don't really add up to an overwhelming amount, I'm gonna be covering all of them today. So basically, we're gonna take a look at every game that starts with or includes the word Yoshi in the title, naturally going in chronological order. A year or so, depending on where you live, after his first outing on the SNES with Mario, Nintendo decided to give Yoshi his very own game for the first time, but not a platformer, mind you, and not even for the SNES. For whatever reason, they decided to make a Yoshi-themed puzzle game for the original NES, with a port for the Game Boy as well, of which I admittedly played for way more hours than I'd like to admit as a kid, and nobody actually bought for me, but that's a little anecdote I'll get to in a minute. Now, it won't take very long after booting up the game and fiddling with the menu till you may stumble upon some very familiar sounding music. For those stumped, turns out Game Freak developed this one quite a few years before Pokemon came to fruition, and it seems they repurposed some bits of Yoshi melodies for Pokemon. I somehow never actually caught on to this as a kid and only just now am realizing it. As I said, I played this game a ton when I was little, not because it's good, necessarily, which I mean, it's not great, it's okay, but we'll get to the gameplay in a second. I played this a lot as a kid after another kid at school literally gave it to me. See, the Game Boy camera had just come out, and some kid at my school told me he had an extra one that he must have just accidentally got as a double for Christmas or his birthday. I don't know. It's not important. The point is, some kid at school was like, hey, I have an extra Game Boy camera. Uh, you can have it if you want. And then he said he'd bring it in. D days kept going by, and he kept telling me he forgot it. Kid always had an excuse. Anyway, one day he finally comes in and tells me he can't find it, but that I can have this other game instead. That game was Yoshi for the Game Boy. Now, hindsight's 2020, and obviously, this kid was a f***ing liar, trying to look cool at school, but whatever, he gave me a game that I ended up spending a lot of time on, and I eventually got a Game Boy camera anyway, so whatever, I digress. So Yoshi, it's a single-screen falling block puzzle game that has a lot of your typical falling block puzzle game fare. A couple different game modes, a difficulty level selection, a speed selection, and a choice of three different songs for the background music. Despite being called Yoshi, you don't actually play as Yoshi, and instead control Mario. 
sort of. Or Luigi if you're playing two-player. Mario sits at the bottom of the screen with his hands out to swap the positions of various Mushroom Kingdom enemies that drop from the top of the screen. There's Goombas, Bloopers, Piranha Plants, and Boos, and similar to a lot of other puzzle games, matching two of them eliminates them from the screen. What makes this game unique, though, is the inclusion of the two Yoshi egg halves. The object is to match a top half with a bottom half, and each time you do that, you hatch a Yoshi, which adds to your total score. But if you can manage to stack some enemies in between the two halves of the egg, you get a higher score for each Yoshi that you hatch. Every once in a while, you get just a top half, which does nothing, but a lot of the strategy of this game involves making decisions on the fly about if you want to play it safe and eliminate a few guys from the screen, or if you want to take a gamble and keep stacking them until a top half happens to pop up. And this is where the game kind of falls short, because the RNG is kind of all over the place in this game. If you pass up a specific piece to wait for another one, it might be nine centuries before the one you actually want pops up again. Now, the Type A game mode is the one I've been talking about, and it just keeps going on, gradually increasing in speed until you finally game over. But game mode B is a little different. Not by much, mind you, don't get excited, but it's my preferred mode of the two. Game mode B is instead separated into stages. It sets up the field with blocks already placed, and instead of seeing how long you can last while racking up points, the goal instead is to eliminate all blocks from the field. This is much more my speed, and I do tend to prefer having a finite goal that I'm working towards instead of just going for as long as I can. Now, I'm not sure if there are infinite stages here, as I kind of suck at puzzle games and I never get very far in them, but this one is definitely more enjoyable for me, and having it split up into actual levels makes it easier on me so I can relax and collect myself after I finish one of them. This is actually my first time playing the NES version. Like I said, I have a lot of experience with the Game Boy port, but this one, as far as I can tell, is nearly identical. I know a lot of people tend to rag on this game, and I've heard quite a few people say it's bad, but I really don't think it's bad at all. It's nothing that's really gonna hold many people's attention nowadays, but when I was a kid, I had a decent amount of fun with it, and going back and playing it now, it's perfectly competent, in my opinion. There just isn't really a whole lot there. Personally, I'd say give it a try, but obviously something like Dr. Mario is a way better option when it comes to puzzle games of this era. I wouldn't say this game is bad, it's just very lackluster. Much more recognizable than the original Yoshi puzzle game, Yoshi's Cookie came out about a year later and was a much better, much more fleshed out game. Much like the prior game, it came out for the NES and Game Boy, but after that was released for the SNES, and since that's the most fleshed out version, that's the one I'm going to be looking at today. They all vary slightly in terms of visuals, but the core gameplay remains the same, and the SNES version has an extra mode that isn't available in the 8-bit versions. As I said, I played a lot of the original Yoshi game on the Game Boy when I was a kid, but somehow, despite seeing this game all over, all the time, not only when I was little, but even today, somehow I managed to go all this time without ever having played it. Not once. So I'm going in totally blind here. No idea how it managed to elude me for three decades, despite also constantly hearing about it all the time, but I've always been curious about it, so today's the day, I guess. So much like a lot of the puzzle games at the time, Yoshi's Cookie is a single-screen, match-the-blocks puzzle game. The blocks this time around are various different cookie shapes which need to be matched in columns and rows to eliminate them off the screen. The one exception is the Yoshi cookie, which basically acts the same way as like a wild card in Uno, where it can stand in for any of the other blocks. New cookies enter the screen from the top and from the side, and you pretty much need to determine which parts of the cookie cluster to eliminate if you happen to have too many on the field. Basically, there's two different directions you can lose from. Each world has 10 stages, and after you beat them, you move on to the next, which is really nothing more than a background change. That's pretty much it for the main mode, though. There's also a versus mode, which you can play against a friend in or play against the CPU. It's a head-to-head -head challenge, and the setup is similar, but not the same. The goal is still to eliminate blocks from the screen, but this time you have one field that's completely filled with cookies, with the goal of reaching 25 points, both before your opponent does and before your timer runs out, which is represented by a fuse. One interesting thing that I wasn't expecting, though, is that each character you play as actually has different stats. There's attack, defense, message, and time limit. Now, you basically have access to a few different attacks that you can use against your opponent during a match. You can obscure your opponent's screen, randomize all their blocks, and also take control of the other player's blocks. Like I said, though, these are random, and instead of strategically using specific attacks depending on the situation, they all just kind of happen. There's no agency. As I said, though, different characters have different stats, so if your character has a high attack stat, their attacks will last longer. If you have a low message stat, you won't get the opportunity to use as many attacks. 
If your character has a low time limit stat, their fuse burns out faster, and if you have a good defense, you can cut down the length of your opponent's attacks. This is actually really surprising, as I was expecting the different characters to just be purposeless, which is usually the case in games like these. It's expected for characters in a racing game or something to have stats that actually change up gameplay, but in a 90s puzzle game, not so much. The last game mode is called Puzzle, and it's actually my favorite of the three. Like before, the setup is very similar to the main mode, more so than the versus mode, only instead of racing against the addition of more and more cookies, there's a set amount of blocks on the screen, and a finite number of moves you can make to eliminate them. There is a timer, but it counts up, not down. So for this one, you can really just sit there and analyze everything that's going on, and rightfully so, as some of these start to get pretty damn tough and confusing. Once again, there's 10 stages per world, with a background change between each, and as you start approaching the latter half of each world's stages, they start getting more and more difficult, with levels 9 and 10 always being noticeably more challenging than the rest. Now, apparently, Alexei Pajit... Pajitnov, I don't, that's, I think that's how you say his name, the creator of Tetris, worked on some of the puzzles in this mode, which is the extra mode that's exclusive to the SNES version. I'm not sure exactly how much of it was worked on by him, but that's pretty neat that they really went out of their way to make the SNES version stand out, instead of just a quick cash grab of a port. Another fun fact was that at one point in time, apparently this game was sold alongside a f***ing oven. They packed in a special edition variant to the game with the purchase of an oven for a promotion, and apparently only 500 were made. Yoshi's Cookie is definitely a huge step up from that original Yoshi puzzle game. While I do still think Yoshi did have a bit of charm to it, there's no denying that this was a huge step up, not just in terms of design and a more fleshed out puzzle game overall, but just with the sheer amount of content available. The NES and Game Boy versions don't have quite the same amount of meat that the SNES version has, but all three would have been easily worth the asking price, especially when compared to the game that came before it. Obviously though, if you're going to play this game, grab the SNES port. Well, this one isn't quite what the Yoshi games would eventually become, but at least this time around, it's an action game and not a puzzle game. Instead, it's something much stranger. Yoshi's Safari. I don't know why it's called Yoshi's Safari, because, well, we aren't on a safari, this is a light gun game for the SNES for use with the Super Scope, which was the SNES's sequel to the NES Zapper. If you've already heard of this game before, you're probably numb to it now, but the fact that they made an on-rail shooter starring Yoshi is still mind-boggling to me. What's even more mind-boggling to me is, after never having played it before, and assuming it was, well, not very good, considering the concept is ridiculous and also Nintendo literally never mentions it ever, is the fact that I actually really liked it, as much as I can possibly enjoy a light gun game anyway. So the game sees Yoshi and Mario after going to visit Princess Peach being asked to save two friends of hers, rulers of a nearby kingdom called Jewelry Land, Prince Pine and King Fret. They've both been kidnapped along with 12 valuable gems that belong to Jewelry Land, so now it's up to Mario and Yoshi to rescue them and take back the 12 gems. Gee, I wonder who's behind all this? So there's 12 stages split between two different maps, with the final 12th stage only appearing once you've beaten the first 11. Each stage houses a missing gem that you obtain after beating the stage. Basically, all the stages consist of these very Super Mario Kart-esque looking tracks where you need to take out enemies on your way to the end, and if you miss enemies, oftentimes they damage you. Taking out enemies sometimes racks up coins, and every so often you'll come across a question mark block which houses a power-up, and you need to shoot it before it disappears off the screen. These stages are for the most part linear, but there are some occasional forks in the road which you can take by shooting open gates. Other than that, there are some instances where some kind of gap or hazard will pop up that you need to jump over, which is conveyed to you by arrows on the ground, but these are relatively easy and also the game uses an audio prompt to really make sure you know when you're supposed to jump. This isn't challenging or anything, but it does switch up the regular stage gameplay just a little bit and add some variety. Now, Turbo Mode is definitely the way to play this game, and I wouldn't call it cheating since the Turbo function comes stock on the Super Scope, but it's also a double-edged sword. See, Yoshi has not only a limited amount of health, but there's also an energy bar for your shots. If you fire too rapidly for too long, you start shooting really slowly until you let it cool off, which only takes a second, but it does add some strategy to the game, especially when fighting bosses. Some stages feature mini-bosses which will pop up about halfway through the stage, and it's usually just some big enemy that can be taken out by spamming the fire button. The real strategy in this game are the main stage bosses, which once defeated, award you one of the 12 gems. For the first seven stages, and the first half of the world map, your main bosses are the Koopalings, and they each have different strategies for beating them. 
Not only do they usually have more than one form, but it's not always immediately obvious how to damage them. These fights surprisingly took some thought and strategy, not only figuring out weak points, but like I said earlier, figuring out the best time to take a break and cool your weapon down. After you beat the first seven stages, you save the king, who tells you that his son, Prince Pine, is still being held captive, along with the remaining five gems. These next stages are a little more interesting in terms of aesthetic, but some of the bosses are kind of meh in comparison. They're all still pretty fun, don't get me wrong, but some of them are just a bit less creative. Instead of the various Koopalings piloting different mechs that all function differently, we get Big Boo and Charging Chuck. I'm probably being a little harsh, but I think some of these should have been the first bosses of the game and save the big Koopaling mech fights for the second half. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, but it was just a little bit underwhelming. When you finally beat all 11 of the regular stages, the final stage opens up, where we take on the final boss, but not before throwing a boss rush at us, which weirdly enough, is actually comprised of all the mini-bosses. This isn't much of a challenge though, save for the Lakitu, which is pretty annoying, but after that, we get to finally take on Bowser. Big surprise, I'm sure nobody saw that one coming. Like the other bosses, he has two phases as well, and at first shows up in full armor. Once the armor is gone, we can lay fire on his poor widow fingies, until he finally throws up a white flag, ending the game. We get a little congratulatory cutscene, and that's all she wrote. It's actually a super short game, only about an hour or two long. However, after beating it for the first time and waiting for the end screen to disappear, Yoshi gives us a little message telling us that if we use a specific button combination, we can unlock a second quest, which in turn at least doubles your playtime if you choose to tackle it. Yoshi's Safari is nothing mind-blowing or anything, but I honestly think it's a fun little game. It's pretty unique, and it's short enough to take on whenever you have a free hour or two. It's a shame Nintendo never released this again on anything else besides the original SNES. This would have honestly been perfect for the Wii or Wii U Virtual Console. Even now, it would be a great addition to Nintendo Switch Online, but for whatever reason, Nintendo just pretends this game doesn't exist. If you have the means to play it, check it out. It's at least moderately enjoyable, and if you don't have access to an SNES and Super Scope, there's plenty of other options, like emulating and using a Wii Remote. Kind of annoying to have to go that route, but I think this one is worth checking out at least once. Hey, real quick, if you like what you're seeing and you want to see more, consider subscribing. I know a lot of people get tired of hearing it, but it really does make a huge difference, especially now that I've started making these longer videos that take more production time. That's all I want to say. Now back to the video. Now, although Yoshi had his name on a few games following his introduction in Super Mario World, it wasn't until 1995 that he would actually get his own true adventure with a similar scope as the main Super Mario series he was created for. After thinking they had exhausted what was possible in progressing the main 2D Mario series, with Mario 64 now in production, they decided to shift gears and try a different approach to a 2D platformer, this time starring Yoshi, and the idea was to slow down the gameplay a bit and make it more accessible. Not necessarily easier, but a little more relaxed and lacking a time limit, all packaged up with a hand-drawn marker or crayon type art style with thick, bold outlines and tons of color to make everything really pop. I'm assuming they weren't 100% confident that Yoshi could pull his own weight though, so they slapped the Super Mario name on it anyway, and we got Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island which pretty much everyone just calls Yoshi's Island. It's absolutely nothing like Super Mario World in its mechanics or level design. Yoshi's Island sees baby Luigi kidnapped by Kamek, with baby Mario being picked up by Yoshi, and now it's up to Yoshi and all the other colored Yoshis to find and reunite Mario and Luigi. The game is not only definitely not a sequel to Super Mario World, but it's actually a prequel. Yoshi's Island's mechanics set the groundwork for the entire platforming Yoshi series going forward, still going strong today. Yoshi can swallow enemies and turn them into eggs, which can then be throne, both as a means of defense and to open up areas or burst open little question mark clouds which hide collectibles and also sometimes acts as a switch for certain things to happen with the stage layout. This is also where Yoshi gets his flutter jump, which gives you a bit more hang time in the air and can be used to cover more distance than jumping alone. Yoshi also doesn't have a run button, which is kind of weird at first if you're coming from the Mario series, but this game doesn't revolve around momentum and physics as closely as Mario does. Speaking of Mario, I guess I'll address the elephant in the room with this game. So, this game is absolutely delightful. It's charming and colorful, has fun mechanics and great music, but dear lord, Baby Mario is absolutely unbearable to listen to. See, instead of a health bar or the power-up tier system like in the Mario series, Yoshi's Island instead has the Baby Mario mechanic. At all times, Mario sits atop Yoshi's back, and if you get hit by an enemy, Baby Mario falls off and starts floating away in a bubble. The countdown then starts, and you need to retrieve him before time runs out, because if it does, the toadies will come kidnap Mario, resulting in the loss of a life. 
There are a couple other ways to die in the game, like colliding with spikes or falling down pits like in the Mario series, but this main baby Mario mechanic is unique to Yoshi's Island. It can get a little frustrating sometimes, but overall it's pretty easy to retrieve Mario without dying. Problem is, baby Mario is, well, a baby. And you probably aren't surprised to find out babies, uh, they fucking cry. They cry a lot. And baby Mario cries a lot. Every single time you get hit, you have to listen to this. This incessant crying is incentive enough to never get hit, but honestly, sometimes it's kind of unavoidable. As annoying as it can get though, it's not a detriment to the game, at least for me. Yoshi's Island is full of creative level design, often incorporating puzzle platforming elements or series of rooms with non-linear means of progression. There's also these transformation power-ups which temporarily turn Yoshi into a variety of different vehicles, which all have context-sensitive challenges involved, and sometimes challenges which involve a power-up for baby Mario as well. I'm not a big fan of these. They're kind of harmless, but in my opinion, I don't think they really add anything. It seems like they exist for variety only, as none of them are really particularly fun, but none of them really overstay their welcome, so it's fine. The bosses are all pretty easy, but they're still pretty fun. At the end of any of the various castle stages, Kamek will try to stop you by casting magic over various regular garden variety enemies and turning them into giant versions of themselves. Most of these can be eliminated pretty quickly by just spamming eggs, but some require a little more strategy or patience. Each level also has three different collectible types which count towards 100% completion. There's these giant smiley flowers, red coins, and these stars which add to your baby Mario timer. There's a tally at the end of each stage, and if all of them are collected, you get a big 100 on the main stage select screen. Now, I know a lot of people think Yoshi's Island is the pinnacle of Yoshi game design. I don't really agree. A lot of people seem to think he set the bar too high with his first outing, but for me, though I do think Yoshi's Island is a great game in its own right, it doesn't really hook me as well as some future entries did. Don't get me wrong, the game is still great, and at only 6 worlds with 48 stages, it definitely doesn't overstay its welcome, but I just don't find Yoshi's Island quite as fun as many others do, at least compared to some other games in the series. Despite that though, nothing can take away the fact that this is an amazing game with an unforgettable art style, iconic music, and it was the foundation for a series that, despite starting off as a spin-off, became a success that didn't need to continue to ride the coattails of the main Mario series. Yoshi's Island gave Yoshi games an identity of their own, to the point where some would even say elements like Shy Guys, for example, are more a part of the Yoshi series than Mario. All right, I know I need to break uh, the rules that I laid out in the beginning a little bit. This game does not have Yoshi anywhere in the title, but make no mistake, this is absolutely part of the Yoshi series. This one is arguably more Yoshi than the other two puzzle games that have Yoshi in the title, so I, I don't even think there's any arguing this. Despite having a fully-fledged platforming Yoshi adventure, we're still not out of the woods yet with these puzzle games. Weirdly enough, I actually went my entire childhood without realizing this was a Yoshi game, because Yoshi is completely absent from not just the title of the game, but the box art itself. See, this game released as Tetris Attack in the US, and it's yet again another Yoshi-themed puzzle game, but if you know anything about this game, you won't be surprised to know that not only does it have absolutely nothing to do with Tetris, but it also initially had nothing to do with Yoshi as well. This story has been told a million times over, but a series known in Japan as Paddled Upon, a puzzle game starring magical fairy girls, I guess at the time of release, wouldn't have been marketable to the US demographic, so they decided to reskin it for the West a couple of different times, probably most notably as Pokemon Puzzle League for the N64. Tetris Attack was a reskin of the Super Famicom version of Paddled Upon, and why they didn't go all in and put Yoshi in the title or box art is astonishing to me, but what we got here is yet another Yoshi puzzle game, this time based on the recently released Yoshi's Island, and everything except name, and lucky for us, this is easily the best of the bunch. Once again, we have a single screen block matching game, but this time around, you can only swap tiles two at a time horizontally, and the blocks continuously stack from the bottom. The goal is to match at least three blocks, but three is the bare minimum, and only serves to eliminate those blocks. It's only once you eliminate four or more at a time, or chain a combo together, that you can momentarily pause new blocks from spawning. If you're impatient, you can hold down the shoulder buttons to spawn new blocks in more quickly, but obviously this is to be used at your own risk, as you can easily screw yourself over if you aren't careful. Now, I suck at puzzle games, and I don't particularly like them very much, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't find this game addictive or see the appeal. Much like what we saw in Yoshi's cookie, there's a few different modes available. 
There's the traditional endless mode that I'm sure you're familiar with by now. Play the game and see how long you can last, as the game gradually increases speed as you play. I'm notoriously not good at these, so I probably spent the least amount of time in this mode. Similarly, there's the time trial mode, which this time gives you a limited amount of time to rack up the highest score possible. Now the stage clear mode is where I started having a little bit more fun with this. Blocks start spawning in and you need to keep clearing them until you reach the finish line. It basically just places the finish line somewhere deep in the layers of blocks and you need to just last long enough to clear everything above the line. I actually had a lot more fun with this mode because as I said earlier, I prefer fixed levels with clear cut finite goals. And because of this, I'm sure it's unsurprising that I also enjoyed puzzle mode, which is similar to what we saw in Yoshi's Cookie. The game gives you unlimited time and a finite amount of maneuvers you can make to eliminate a specific set of blocks from the screen. Once again, these are more my speed, as I prefer puzzles to be something more difficult where I'm not racing the clock and can just sit there and analyze each situation on my own terms. I prefer when the difficulty of a puzzle comes from the puzzle itself, as opposed to just the amount of pressure that I'm under. Now, the versus mode, well, I'm, I'm really not sure why it's called versus mode and why it's all the way at the bottom of the list, but this is Tetris attack story mode, and it's where most of the meat of the Yoshi elements lie. Bowser casts a spell on a bunch of Yoshi's uh, friends. I, I guess they're his friends now, even though the majority of them were enemies from Yoshi's Island. But anyway, uh, he casts a spell on them to make them do his bidding. Now under his control, the only way to break Bowser's spell is to, well, uh, beat them all at Battle the Pond. Yoshi was for whatever reason unaffected by Bowser's spell, so now it's up to him to rescue all his friends and defeat Bowser. This mode is a head-to-head -head battle against a bunch of CPUs and the rules are mostly the same, except for this time around, getting more than three blocks eliminated at a time or getting a combo results in giant blocks falling on your opponent's screen, increasing the overall stress level here. Now, there's an easy, medium, and hard mode available, but by entering a button combination, you can also unlock very hard mode, which, shocker, I'm definitely not touching. Each of these matches are separated kind of in a stage-by-stage -stage world map situation, showing you each new friend that needs to be saved before you start a stage. I don't know why this mode is so weirdly named and tucked at the bottom of the game mode list, but if you're trying to get the most Yoshi out of this game, this will be where you'll find it. As I said, I'm not a huge fan of puzzle games, but every so often I play one that I find myself having a noticeably more enjoyable time with than others, and this is definitely one of them. I still think it's very stupidly named and they should have leaned into the Yoshi thing a little further. I don't know why they went Tetris, but this is definitely a standout SNES puzzle game. <laughs> Now this is a game I played more than most when I was a kid. It was the first game I got from my N64, and having not really had much experience with Yoshi's Island before this, I didn't really have much to compare it to as far as Yoshi games go. I actually didn't even realize until I was an adult that apparently Yoshi's Story was disappointing for a lot of people that liked Yoshi's Island, and to some degree I do get that, a little, because Yoshi's Story isn't really as much of a follow-up to Yoshi's Island as much as it's kind of a sidestep. I've heard people say this game is bad, but honestly I really don't see it. Sure, it's different, but it just kind of does its own thing. It's more slow-paced and exploratory in comparison. So, a spell was cast on Yoshi's Island and it gets turned into a storybook, and the Yoshi's super happy tree vanishes. Six Yoshi eggs survived the yoshi apocalypse, and they realize this could only be the work of Baby Bowser. They decide that the only way to defeat Baby Bowser and return Yoshi's Island to its original happy form and save the super happy tree is by becoming super happy by eating a, a bunch of fruit and defeating Baby Bowser. Now, the controls are mostly similar. The physics are different, but the base mechanics are the same. Yoshi can run around, flutter jump, and throw eggs just like in the first game. But as I said, this game sort of asks you to stop and smell the roses a little more. See, instead of your typical reach the goalpost platformer, Yoshi's story takes a different approach. The levels are completed once Yoshi eats 30 fruits which are scattered throughout each stage. You can rush your way through eating everything in sight, or you can pass up fruits that you see and take your time exploring the levels, racking up a higher score, finding the hidden hearts in each stage, and even finding the two secret hidden black and white Yoshis, as well as a white shy guy which can save one of your other Yoshis if you happen to lose a life. Instead of a normal numbered life system, the game starts you off with a selection of different colored Yoshis, and if you die as one of them, that Yoshi is captured and you can't play as them again. That is, unless you use a white shy guy to rescue one of them. 
This is super helpful when it comes to the black and white Yoshi, which not only am I usually reluctant to use because of their elusiveness, but holding on to them actually changes the end screen of the game. However, there is a benefit to actually playing with them besides just the fact that they look cool. These Yoshis possess extra abilities, like being able to eat black Shy Guys and peppers without being harmed. So there is incentive to play as them, but it's nerve-wracking to actually do so. Luckily, having a white Shy Guy available just in case gives you enough insurance to be a little bit more willing to play as them. Now, there's six worlds, or pages as they're called in this game, and you can play through one stage per page. The game is structured similarly to something like Star Fox, I guess, where each run you can only play through one of each possible level per area. Each of the six worlds have four stages, and depending on which ones you choose, more of them become available. So to actually complete the game, you need to play through it multiple times, but that's honestly a lot of the fun in my opinion. Each level you can select has its own unique level mechanics and gimmicks, and having the choice to select which route you want to take adds a lot of replay value and keeps things fresh. Now once you've beaten certain levels, you can unlock them in the trial mode via the menu, which once you finish all of them, gives you access to select and play any stage in the game. As I said before, there's the hidden black and white Yoshis, which are unlocked by finding their giant eggs in certain stages and finishing the level with them. Once you do that, they become playable. If you manage to finish the game with either or both, not only do they appear in the end screen along with the other Yoshis, but they also now become selectable from the start if you begin a new game. Honestly, the hidden Yoshis and White Shy Guy thing are such peak 90s video game features, and I wish more games did stuff like that nowadays. As I mentioned earlier, apparently a lot of people didn't like this game, and I don't really understand why. I've been playing it since I was like 7 or 8 years old, and I always liked it. Sure, I wasn't directly comparing it to Yoshi's Island, but even now, going back and playing it as an adult after not having played it for what's honestly a pretty decent chunk of years, I'm still finding myself enjoying it. It's a lot more laid back when compared to Island, and I think that might be part of why I like it. I think the controls are solid, the level design is good, and the stage gimmicks are surprisingly pretty unique and, for the most part, fun. Not saying it's a 10 out of 10, but I think it gets a bad rap, and I think it's because of the comparison. If I'm comparing this to Island, of course it's not going to stand up, it's just not the same type of game despite being a platformer, but I think if you throw that idea away and just take the game for what it is, Yoshi's story becomes a lot more enjoyable. If you haven't played it in a while, and you don't remember much of it, I'd say give it a shot. And if you've never played it before, I'd say give it a chance despite people nowadays kind of bragging on it. Okay, so this isn't really going to be a full-on section, but I didn't want to do this video without at least talking about this for a second. I'm not even sure there's all that much information out there about why or how this exists. IGN talked about it a long time ago, but even back then, that included some inaccurate information in it. In any case, at one point or another, Nintendo must have been working on a Game Boy Advance port of Yoshi's Island. Normally, I'd think this was just like a tech demo or something, but this has to be either some kind of proof of concept or some kind of groundwork for a port that either didn't get greenlit or got canceled super quickly. Because as barren and simple as it is, There's some elements in here that I'm surprised to see, like the game over castle animation, for example. What we have here is one single looping stage based on Yoshi's story. When you first boot the game up, we see a rotating Yoshi's Island, which serves as a title screen, albeit without any title. Pressing start throws us into this endless level, and there's really not a whole lot to do here. Yoshi has eggs, but they can't be thrown. Instead, they act as a health meter, which is also strange considering the normal health meter is right there in the corner. But This is further confirmed by the fact that you can find eggs in the stage, which not only add a lost egg back, but also increase the flower health bar. Enemies can only be jumped on since Yoshi can't throw eggs, and can't be swallowed since the B button does nothing. The shoulder button, I think it's the L button if I remember correctly, zooms the camera in like you can in Yoshi's story, and ground pounding still changes the color of Shy Guys. Toadies are now regular enemies that drop spike balls on you, and bullet bills look absolutely f***ing terrifying. There's also this giant shy guy for whatever reason, as well as hidden balloons that you can spawn by hitting the blocks, and then ground pound to either reveal an enemy or an egg. Other than that, all that's here is just a looping stage. If you didn't realize that before trying this out, you'd probably start to wonder why stuff keeps looking so familiar. It's an infinite loop. There's not much to do here, but this seems like it actually could have worked if they actually went through with making the game. It surprisingly looks pretty good on the GBA. It sucks they never kept going and made the game, but it's still pretty cool that the ROM is preserved and able to be played today. Every so often, games came out for the Game Boy or Game Boy Advance that added additional tech directly into the cartridge, either to add a new unique feature to the game or to create a new gimmick around it. Yoshi Topsy Turvy, or also known by its more insane title outside the US, Yoshi's Universal Gravitation, adds motion control functionality, allowing for a directional tilt, which the entire game and its mechanics are built around. 
Let me start this off by saying that this was an absolute nightmare to properly record footage of. See, the tech is built right into the cartridge, so there's real tangible hardware that needs to be accounted for. Sure, I could have just emulated it, and that would have worked, but that wouldn't give me a proper feel for how the game actually plays. The closest emulated option would have been to use a modded Wii and then emulate it, mapping the Wii remote to account for the tilt. This would have been close, but still, because the physics and controls of this game were bound to the cartridge, I needed to use the real cartridge to get the full experience. Now, people have been known to use a GameCube with a Game Boy player to record a similar game, Kirby Tilt and Tumble. This game was for the Game Boy Color, and you control Kirby by tilting around the Game Boy, but the only way we can capture the game feed is through a Game Boy player. So that's why Dan Ray's tilting a GameCube. But the problem there is, the game is mainly played with the tilt itself. Yoshi Topsy Turvy, on the other hand, constantly utilizes both the tilt and the D-pad and buttons, so that wasn't possible either. I then came up with an idea to use my analog pocket, which up to this point, I have not touched, like at all. So with this situation presenting itself, at least now I have a reason to justify buying the stupid thing. Instead of docking it directly for capture through HDMI, I could run a USB-C extension cable from the pocket to the dock. One small problem, the analog pocket's D-pad and face buttons all get disabled when it enters docked mode. There was only one other option. I zip tied the pocket to a Switch Pro controller to create this monstrosity, which funny enough, isn't too far off from something Nintendo has actually officially suggested doing when Splatoon 1 came out. Anyway, after jumping through a million hoops, I was able to properly play and capture the game. It's f***ing terrible. At first glance, it looks like your typical Yoshi's Island type game, and for most of my life, I assumed that's what it was, with some added tilt gimmicks. It isn't. The entire game is built around really, really terrible tilt controls, and this is one of the most frustrating experiences with a video game I think I've ever had. I'm not even going to bother getting into the story because it ultimately doesn't matter. Basically, you go through each stage of each of the six worlds with the goal of making it to the end of the stage while completing specific missions. These range from swallowing a certain number of fruit, collecting a certain number of coins, getting to the end of the stage in under a certain amount of time, so on and so forth, and sometimes dual missions where you need to complete a combination of both. It's hard to really convey how bad this game actually feels to play. I guess Yoshi's normal walk and jump feels sort of fine, but his flutter jump is weirdly not very useful. It barely gets you any height or hang time and ends super abruptly. Most of the game, though, as I said, is built around the tilt. You use the tilt not to tilt Yoshi or objects in the stage, but the stage itself. Doing this does move objects around, but this also affects the physics of Yoshi's jump. And even after pushing my way through the entire game, I never got used to it. It's weirdly always either too sensitive or not sensitive enough, and a lot of the times you need to jump from moving object to moving object, all while trying to sort out which direction to tilt to make Yoshi jump or fall normal. And it doesn't help that during the second half of the game, there's insta-kill spikes literally everywhere. The amount of times the game has thrown me around like a rag doll, only for me to end up on instant kill spikes, resulting in me getting a game over and needing to replay the stage 400 times, happened more times than I can count. Honestly, if you've ever played Mario Sunshine, you know the Pachinko Shine Sprite mission that everyone hates? I really don't think it's a stretch to say that's pretty much what this game feels like, only it's not one mission in one game, it's an entire actual game. Now, there's a couple of boss fights. Well, really, there's... There's only one. You technically fight a fake Bowser after the fourth world, but it's not really a fight, and it's just a get-to-the-end-of-the-stage mission. The final Bowser fight, though, is a real fight, and you basically just need to tilt these bombs in Bowser's direction while avoiding his fire breath and various enemies. There's a few other minigames that consist of hitting symbols and collecting coins, but it's honestly just, like, the same thing over and over for the most part, just with increasing difficulty. There's really not much variation in level design or themes, and it seems like the entire game was just built as an afterthought for the tilt physics themselves as opposed to genuinely having a good idea for an original Yoshi game and using the tilt tech as a vehicle for it. I'd like to go more in depth, but honestly, the game lacks any actual depth that I'd be able to really elaborate on. It would just be me sitting here telling you how big of a piece of shit this game is and how bad of a time I had playing it because that's really all there is to it. If you've seen any amount of footage from this game, you've seen pretty much everything it has to offer. I really do not recommend that anyone plays this game unless you're just really in the mood to have a shitty afternoon. Okay, so this one, I was 
unaware of this until making this video, but this literally is barely a game, and how this was released as an actual $30 DS game is insane to me. If you've only seen a screenshot or two, you'd probably assume Yoshi Touch & Go is just some kind of platformer with some gimmicky touchscreen elements, similar to what we saw with Yoshi Topsy Turvy. Instead, we have something quite akin to a mobile game. Now, there's multiple modes in the game, but there's really no reason to go over all of them because they're essentially just slightly different flavors of the exact same minigame, which is literally the entirety of Yoshi Touch & Go. See, the game initially started out as a tech demo showcasing some of the capabilities of the Nintendo DS, and I guess it went over so well that they decided to actually release it as a full game. Despite putting it on a cartridge, though, it basically just feels like a glorified tech demo. As I said, the entire game is basically just one minigame, which is comprised of two sections, Baby Fall and Yoshi Walk. See, every time you start a new game, Baby Mario starts falling from the sky and you need to use the stylus to draw clouds on the bottom screen. These clouds redirect Mario's path, allowing you to collect coins as well as avoid enemies. You can also turn enemies into coins by drawing a circle around them. Once you make it to the bottom, uh, assuming you did, Yoshi will start carrying Baby Mario, and this is where the main meat of the game lies. The Baby Mario falling thing is sort of the pre-minigame before the actual minigame. Once again, you use the stylus to make paths out of clouds for Yoshi to walk on. You can circle enemies again, turning them into coins, and you can tap Yoshi to jump. And you can now throw eggs to attack enemies or grab coins. You have a limited number of eggs though, and eating fruit replenishes some of your eggs. Actually, if you manage to grab enough coins on your way down, the game will start you off with a different colored Yoshi. The more coins you manage to grab, the better Yoshi you'll start with, and each of these colors can carry more and more eggs at a time. You also will upgrade Yoshis at certain checkpoints, but as this is sort of an endless runner type of game, it's very much just a see how far you can go type of deal, and if you get hit even once, it's game over. The game starts you off with two accessible modes as well as a versus mode, and two more modes can be unlocked by getting a high score, and considering I'm not very good at the game and it's very monotonous, I wasn't about to bust my ass trying to unlock new modes for basically the exact same minigame. I do know there's another mode where you need to save baby Luigi. I think it's in either time attack or challenge mode or something, but just knowing it exists is enough for me. I don't need to experience it myself. Don't get me wrong, I do see the appeal. The game is kind of fun, but I'm just not the mobile game endless runner type. I'm sure lots of other people would enjoy this game. Maybe not even to play all the time, but maybe just to pick up when you have a few minutes to kill to try to get a high score. That being said though, this game being released as a full price DS game is absolutely bonkers. This is a $5 eShop game at best. However, back in 2005, there was no eShop. I guess considering that, I'm not sure what other option Nintendo would have had to sell this game, but honestly, it's probably just should have either been a pack-in game that was included with the purchase of a DS, or this should have just been put on the back burner and thrown into a future Yoshi game as a little extra minigame feature or something. The game is fun, all things considered, there just really isn't much content here. It's just the same endless minigame over and over, and it feels like they included these multiple different modes so that they could try to justify the price tag by creating the illusion of content, albeit lazily at best when the reality of it is that, well, this is basically just a tech demo. And the worst part is, there have been many pack-in games over the years that were glorified tech demos, but actually had enough content in them to qualify as actual games. I mean, just look at Wii Sports or Nintendo Land. Honestly, if I was a kid and I heard a new Yoshi game came out for the DS and I asked for this for a holiday or a birthday, and then this is what I actually received, I'd be fucking pissed. And unfortunately, the fact that this was sold as a full price game kind of takes away from the fact that the game, as short and simple as it is, really isn't half bad. Like I said, these definitely aren't my types of games, but I've dabbled in enough of them to know this one was actually pretty decent. Not to mention, the visuals, as you'd probably expect, are charming and colorful, as they're basically just an updated take on the Yoshi's Island aesthetic. Yoshi Touch & Go should have never been a full price game, that much I'm sure of, but nowadays, if you like this kind of game, I'd say it's worth checking out. It's definitely pretty fun and admittedly pretty addictive. I kept recording footage even when I knew I had enough. Oh. And if you want to have a real wild time, you can reverse Yoshi's direction in the main options menu. Now, I'm assuming this is probably for people who are left-handed, but you won't catch me complaining about a mirror mode. I'll be honest, for about the first 10 years Yoshi's Island DS was out, I was completely under the impression that this was just a port of Yoshi's Island for the DS. If you only took a quick glance at the box art without really looking close and all you had to go on was the name, 
there's a good chance you'd come to the same conclusion I did. And considering Nintendo's track record with naming schemes like uh, the Mario Advance series, it's unsurprising that this flew under my radar for as many years as it did. To my surprise, Yoshi's Island DS was not a port, but in fact, a brand new sequel developed for the DS, fully utilizing the DS's dual screen setup, for better or for worse. While the game doesn't take advantage of the touchscreen, thank God, it does take up the double screen real estate with its level design. Now, Yoshi's Island DS is very, very similar to the first game, at least in terms of its aesthetic and graphics, even down to the level select screen, looking almost pulled directly from the original Yoshi's Island. Don't let this all fool you though, because Yoshi's Island DS is very much its own game. Not only is it a fully fledged sequel building off of the first game's mechanics, but it now brings its own mechanics to the table in the form of more babies. Story-wise, things don't really make a whole lot of sense in terms of lore. There's a lot of plot holes that uh, need to exist for this to happen, but Yoshi's Island stars not only Baby Mario, but Baby Peach, Baby DK, Baby Wario, and even Baby Bowser as a playable character. You unlock more baby characters as you make your way through the stages, and each baby has their own unique powers and mechanics that can be swapped whenever you find a stork stop. Honestly, this is a very similar setup to something like DK64, only way less restricting, and more often than not, not mandatory. It's very similar conceptually, but executed arguably far more gracefully. As I said, each baby has their own specific mechanic that changes up how you interact with the stages. Baby Mario can make Yoshi run, as well as making the various M blocks seen throughout the stages tangible. This run helps a lot in boss fights, so typically I switch to Mario before entering a boss room. Peach can use her parasol to make Yoshi's flutter jump raise him high in the air when there's a gust of wind present, but this affects Yoshi's normal flutter jump, making it a lot slower and heavier feeling, as well as nerfing Yoshi's egg throwing ability by not allowing eggs to bounce off walls. Baby DK can climb and swing on specific vines, and having Baby DK with you stops your eggs from bouncing, but in exchange, gives the eggs an AoE explosion, and he even has a dash attack. Baby Wario has a... A magnet. He has a magnet. That's it. I don't know why they gave DK the dash attack and not Wario, but all right. It, his magnet attracts metal things. Go crazy. And last but not least, Baby Bowser can breathe fire, but this disables Yoshi's ability to swallow enemies, which means you can't create eggs. You can still collect eggs, but a lot of the time you can just use Baby Bowser's fire instead of throwing an egg anyway. Now, as I said, most of the time, it's absolutely not necessary to select any specific baby. If you want to go for 100% though, that's a different story, and there's some backtracking here and there that you need to do if you want to go for that. But outside of the small sections here and there where the game does sometimes require you to have a specific baby, more often than not, you can just run through the majority of the game with whatever baby you want. And in the instances where the game does require a specific one, it's usually pretty forgiving with where it places stork stops so you can just swap without needing to go very far and waste your time. And that's one of the reasons I think this works a lot better than it did in a game like DK64. Yoshi's Island DS doesn't egregiously waste your time. Now, I've heard quite a few people say they didn't like this game very much because of the baby mechanic, and because of this, before going into it, I thought I was going to have a way worse time than I actually did. The whole multiple baby gimmick really doesn't, at least in my opinion, detract from my overall enjoyment of the game. I honestly think it adds a lot. Kind of like Mario Kart Double Dash and what that game did with how it mixed up the Mario Kart formula, while I wouldn't want it to be a thing they'd continue to do going forward, and I'm glad they didn't, it's a unique little spin on the Yoshi formula that makes this game stand out from a lot of the other Yoshi platformers. As far as the dual screen thing goes, I can take it or leave it, really. Honestly, if I had to really make a decision, I'd probably rather just have one screen to deal with, but it really doesn't hurt the game in any way. It did allow them to add a little more verticality into the game's level design, and I think they pulled it off pretty well without it being annoying. Going into this game, I had a feeling I'd probably like it more than some people led me to believe I would, and it turns out I was right. Yoshi's Island DS is pretty fun, and a worthy sequel in my opinion, and in terms of its gameplay, it did something to make itself stand out while not straying too far from its original source material. I just wish I could say the same for its unfortunate, very badly named stupid title. Part of a long series of games and products Nintendo for whatever reason started branding as new, started by New Super Mario Bros. for the DS, and continued even into recent releases like New Pokemon Snap, we have yet another entry in a cavalcade of badly titled games. Yoshi's New Island for the 3DS is to Yoshi's Island what New Super Mario Bros. is to the original 2D Mario games. In concept, anyway. 
In execution, NSMB did a lot more to revitalize the old Mario formula, while Yoshi's New Island kind of played it safe and for the most part stuck to a very strict, similar formula to the other Yoshi's Island games, not doing a whole lot to change up mechanics or physics. Now, ever since I've heard people talk about this game, I've heard nothing but negative takes about it. How the game is terrible, how the music is offensively bad, and how it's overall just a really bad Yoshi game. But when I first played through the game back around the time it came out, I didn't hear any of that. I wasn't looking at other people's opinions online, and as far as my initial playthrough, which basically existed in a vacuum, I liked it. Actually, I, I didn't even just like it. I wasn't amazed, necessarily, but I really enjoyed what I played and I thought it was a pretty fun entry in the series. Yeah, it did play it safe, only really adding a couple new mechanics into the mix like the giant eggs and the tilt functionality for the transformation sections, and yeah, the level design didn't blow me away, but as far as I can tell, it was solid. And as far as the music goes, at least back then, I didn't remember being bothered by it. It was only until a few years later that I even realized people didn't like the game. It's been almost a decade now, and for a while now, I've been interested in revisiting it, as over the years I've seen so many people rag on it. Was I wrong the first time around? Was I just remembering it wrong, or was I more willing to accept a subpar game back then? It's safe to say that now I'm at least a little more jaded than I was back then, so maybe if I went back to it now, I would see all these glaring flaws that everyone else seems to. Well, since I started producing this video, it was time to do just that, and honestly, now that I've played through it again with a bit more of an analytical eye, man, I still don't see the problem. The game holds up pretty damn well in my opinion. Sure, it's not going to blow anyone's minds, but if you like the Yoshi's Island games, this is more of that with a new coat of paint. It's not quite as bright and colorful as the others since it kind of took the original Yoshi's Island look and sort of did its own take on it, but apart from that, I had a good time with it. Again. As far as the music goes, I, once again, don't really see the problem. I feel like people latched onto like one or two songs that sounded a little off or weird and then ran with it. It's very strange. It really feels like people think this entire game is hot garbage based on two subpar songs from the OST. I actually don't even think the majority of the OST is bad either, and some songs are actually pretty good. It's fun, it's cute, it's playful, it's quite literally a paint by numbers Yoshi soundtrack, no more, no less. Like, no, of course, it's not winning a Grammy, but it fits the tone of not just the game, but the series as a whole, and besides a track or two, it's totally fine. And that's honestly my takeaway from this game overall. Yoshi's New Island is fine. Hell, I even actually like it quite a bit, but if I'm talking objectively how this game holds up in overall quality of the level design, controls, music, and overall fun factor, man, the game is fine. I truly think this game was judged way, way too harshly. A lot of people also seem to take issue with the twist end boss of big ass actual Big Daddy Bowser from the future, but it, like, does anyone really care? Like, actually, it's a Yoshi game. Why anyone would actually be concerned about how much sense the story makes is beyond me, and if I'm being honest here, I think if you're really stipulating on that, you probably aren't playing a Yoshi game for the right reasons. I think if you just give the game a real shot, and don't just write it off based on the loud opinions on the internet, I feel like a lot of fans of Yoshi platformers would have, at the very least, a decently fun time with Yoshi's New Island. I assure you, it will not blow your mind, but if you like Yoshi's Island and you think those games are a fun, relaxing, but yet somehow sometimes challenging time with a collection element that you find satisfying, you might have a good time with it, because Yoshi's New Island is just more of that. Yoshi's New Island is more Yoshi's Island. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, there are some two-player minigames that you do unlock as you play through the game, but unfortunately, I have no way of checking them out as they're strictly two-player only, so that aspect I can't really give my opinion on. As far as the main game, though, it's fun, straightforward, doesn't overstay its welcome, but also isn't too overly short either, and I would recommend it to any Yoshi fan. And if you have played it before, maybe consider revisiting it. If you still don't like it, that's fair, but I do think a lot of people write this game off without actually giving it a shot. We've finally reached the game I was looking forward to replaying during the majority of this video's production. This unassuming game that I pretty much bought on a whim ended up becoming one of my favorite 2D platformers of all time. When Yoshi's Woolly World was first announced, it may have been easy to write the game off as style over substance, but that would have been the furthest thing from the truth. Goodfeel, the developers of Kirby's Epic Yarn, a cute and good-looking and moderately fun but overall a little underwhelming Kirby game, would take the aesthetic idea behind Kirby's Epic Yarn and bring that over to the Yoshi universe. But whereas Kirby's Epic Yarn was kind of too easy for its own good, 
Yoshi's Woolly World would not only stick to the Yoshi's Island traditional platforming formula, but it would, in my opinion anyway, excel at it, exceeding my expectations and usurping nearly every Yoshi game that came before it, at least according to me. If you've ever seen footage of Yoshi's Woolly World before, watching videos on YouTube really does not do the game justice. It's the kind of game you really need to play for yourself to get the full effect. There's a lot of detail that kind of gets lost once you record footage of it, but just trust me, the game looks even better if you play it for yourself. Yoshi's Woolly World follows a similar formula to the other Yoshi's Island games, with six main worlds, each housing a handful of stages, separated by both mini and main boss castle stages, respectively. The collection aspect is much the same as well, only this time, it's mixed up just a bit. While you have your typical flowers to collect and stars to add to your health meter in an effort to complete each stage with full health, this time around, we have two new collectibles. The stamp patches, which are hidden inside beads, which take the place of coins in Woolly World, which, when collecting enough of, unlock stamps to be used in Miiverse, rest in peace, and the batches of wool. See, at the start of the game, Kamek turns all the different Yoshis into bundles of wool and scatters them throughout the stages. Once you collect all the bundles of wool in a stage, you unlock a new Yoshi, which are all themed differently. This doesn't do anything mechanically, but it does let you switch and use different Yoshis throughout your adventure, and the more you unlock, the more choices you have. Speaking of, Yoshi's Woolly World also has amiibo functionality, and when you scan any number of amiibo into the game, they unlock a different Yoshi themed after whatever amiibo you scanned. Unless the amiibo isn't compatible, in which case you get this. Woolly World, despite not having much mechanical functionality when it comes to amiibo, had quite a big amiibo push that came along with it. Nintendo made little Yarn Yoshi amiibo to coincide with the game, as well as a big-ass Yarn Yoshi which now costs about $10,000. Yoshi's Woolly World's art style isn't just an aesthetic thing either. Much like Kirby, Yoshi's Woolly World's stylistic gimmick is woven, no pun intended, into the game's mechanics. A lot of stage gimmicks revolve around the fact that Yoshi and everything else in the game are made out of yarn. For example, unlike in Yoshi's Island, where you throw eggs at enemies and take them out wholesale, in Woolly World, yarn balls take the place of eggs, and some enemies like piranha plants can't just be taken out with a hit from them. Instead, they get all tangled up in yarn, giving you a window to jump on them to take them out. Woolly World was actually the first Yoshi game I've completed 100%. Not just because of the unlockable Yoshi incentive, but also because of the addition of the badges. A mechanic I, for the most part, did not utilize. But when it comes to completion, they came in handy. Basically, as you play the game, you unlock these badges which can be equipped before each stage in exchange for some of your gems. Now, these range from typical stage power-ups or buffs like increased defense or speed to what I use them for, uncovering hidden gems that you're stuck on. Now, I think abusing these would spoil some of the fun since Yoshi games are notorious for hiding collectibles all over the place, but I much prefer the option of a little hint system as opposed to just needing to look things up online. This should go without saying, but a platformer is nothing without good level design, and Yoshi's Woolly World also delivers on that front, with most stages being a great evolution of the linear Yoshi's Island stage layouts, and some occasionally deviating from the norm and throwing in some non-linear variety. If you've ever played Donkey Kong Country Returns or Tropical Freeze, in my opinion, those games to the original SNES Donkey Kong Country games are what Woolly World is to the original Yoshi games. It takes the foundation set by the series, evolves it, and then just goes crazy with it. And the music is really good too, which actually surprises me because if you've been a fan of this franchise, you'd know music is something people have had issues with here and there, and yet I've not heard anyone ever have anything bad to say about Woolly World's OST. Yoshi's Woolly World is an incredible game. One of my favorite 2D platformers of the HD era, and if you've never played it before, you need to. Unfortunately, the cowards at Nintendo never did, or yet anyway, port it to the Switch, so it's stuck on Wii U. There is a 3DS port, however, called Poochie in Yoshi's Woolly World, which adds a little bit of content, but at the expense of a huge hit in fidelity, which kind of ruins the aesthetic and omits the hub world entirely. Now, this doesn't entirely ruin the game, and the mass majority of the experience is still there, so if a 3DS is your only option, it's still worth it. But if you have access to a Wii U, the console version is definitely the way to go. When Yoshi's Crafted World was first revealed, to say I was extremely excited would be an enormous understatement. Yoshi's Woolly World ended up being one of my favorite platformers I've ever played, so ever since that game, I was eagerly awaiting the day we'd see another Yoshi game. Not only that, Crafted World would see good feel returning to develop the game, and like the previous entry, it would feature another similar aesthetic, this time going for a sort of arts and crafts style look, 
with felt Yoshis this time, and level assets that consisted of a mixture of construction paper and household cardboard objects and the like. To top it all off, this game looked a bit different in its level design, at least that's how it seemed. While Woolly World leaned more into the straightforward platforming scene in Yoshi's Island, Crafted World seemed to be taking a few cues from Yoshi's story, which, as I mentioned before, was one of my favorite games growing up. It seemed a bit more slow-paced, with just a little bit more exploration involved. There was also a mechanic that was revealed where you could flip the stage and play the stage with the camera facing the opposite direction, seeing all the level assets from behind, revealing a layer of the stage that wasn't viewable to the player, at least initially. This, however, would be changed at some point during development, and instead of being a cool mechanic that could be used at will, like the trailer made it seem, it was relegated to a mode that ended up being one of the few reasons this game ended up receiving pretty mixed reviews. Yeah, turns out, not a lot of people ended up liking this game. I've heard countless people say the game is too easy, too slow, has boring level design, has annoying and bad music, and the main problem everyone seems to have with it, it's a total bitch to complete. So to actually complete the game, much like in a lot of Yoshi games, you need to find every hidden flower as well as every red coin and complete the stage without taking damage. Now, this is all doable. It's very similar to a lot of other Yoshi games, and Crafted World actually has the addition of these unlockable costumes you can wear, which act as a shield, giving you multiple hits you can take before actually taking damage, completely mitigating the whole damage list thing. But that's not where it ends. To actually fully complete each stage, you also need to go on these scavenger hunts where you need to find and throw an egg at specific papercraft objects in the foreground or background. Then comes the camera flip mechanic. Instead of it being a baked-in mechanic, it now turns into a mode where you just need to run through the stage in the opposite direction and find these poochie pups which are scattered throughout the stage. The stages have all been simplified, so there isn't a whole lot of challenge involved. Basically, you need to just play each stage 400 times to actually complete it. But here's the thing. You don't need to do that. That's literally only for completion. And that's kind of my problem with most of the criticisms of the game. Most of the stuff people complain about are things that you don't actually need to do. I played through the game to the end without almost ever touching any of those extra objectives. They're there if you want to do them, but it isn't necessary. Actually, all it really does is give you more and more flowers to unlock secret post-game levels. I played the game like normal, and by the end I had enough flowers to unlock two of the stages, and Crafted World actually did something that surprised me. In most Yoshi games, like say, let's just take it back to Yoshi's Island for example, I have no true incentive to complete levels. Sure, 100%ing unlocks things, but if I'm just trying to play the game through to the end without going above and beyond to complete it, the game doesn't actually give me much more reason to actually collect anything. I have a similar issue with games like Donkey Kong Country Returns or Tropical Freeze. These games don't give me enough of a reason to find hidden collectibles unless I'm already going for 100%. Crafted World, however, has a progression system that's actually kind of similar to something like your typical collectathon. Each new area can only be unlocked by trading in a certain amount of your collected flowers. Now, while this does gatekeep entry to new areas despite having beaten the stages before them, this incentivizes collection. It gives you an actual reason for collecting things that goes beyond just going for completion, and I think that's a smart call. If you just play it straight through without worrying about completing it, the game is actually really fun. I honestly think most of the level design is solid, and it has quite a bit of smart environmental puzzles in most of its stages. There's also a decent amount of bosses, which, to be fair, are pretty easy, but they're still fun to figure out nonetheless. I also do not think the music is anywhere near as egregious as most people, for whatever reason, make it out to be. I actually kind of like it. It's pretty par for the course as far as good feel games go, and it fits right in as a Yoshi soundtrack. Now, don't get me wrong, Yoshi's Crafted World isn't amazing, but I still think it's a pretty good game. I actually ended up liking it, like, a lot. Nowhere near as much as Woolly World, but not at all mid, as some people seem to call it. And let's be honest, it didn't stand a chance against Woolly World anyway, but that says more about Woolly World than anything. I think Yoshi's Crafted World is a really fun game, and I honestly think people were kind of hard on it. And when it comes to completion, I don't even think it's that bad. If you're trying to binge it, yeah, sure, it's a lot, but I think if you just play it as the game presents itself aesthetically, and just sit down and relax with the game for an hour or so at a time, I really don't think you'll have a bad time chipping away at it, and before you know it, you'll have completed it. Crafted World is a good game, and damn it, I'll die on this hill. 
And that's all of them, at least for now anyway. Yoshi's Crafted World was only a few years ago, so it's not like this is some dormant series that we're unsure if we'll see another entry in. I'm sure a new one will pop up sooner than later. I mean, Crafted World only came out about four years after Woolly World, so I'd say we're about due. However, I know the Switch is getting up there in age, so my assumption is they'll probably wait till the Switch's successor before announcing something new. Still though, the Yoshi series, more specifically the games that riff off the Yoshi's Island formula, have always been kind of the underdog in my opinion. It doesn't strike me as a series that people are busting down the doors of GameStop at midnight on release day over, but I think it deserves more merit than it gets. It's a tried and true series that even at its worst is still a fun time, and at its best can achieve unrivaled creativity and charm, most notably with Woolly World, a game I still hold as one of my favorite platformers. However, I cannot say the same with the spin-offs, especially with something like Yoshi Topsy Turvy, which I get was a demonstration of the technology but that game made me unreasonably frustrated and angry. Yoshi games shine brightest when building off the skeleton of Yoshi's Island, and I have no doubt in my mind they'll knock it out of the park again in due time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to see everything I upload, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. And if you want to help support the channel, I also have a Patreon right there too.